You're in the water loop. <laughs> Welcome to Waterloop, the podcast that explores solutions for sustainability and equity in water. I'm the host, Travis Loop. This episode is part of a series, Mississippi by Nature, that looks at the use of nature-based solutions to help the river and its communities. The series is supported by the Walton Family Foundation and outfitted by Patagonia. No one has a bigger role in managing the Mississippi River than the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'm here at their headquarters in New Orleans to talk to them about this. I want to hear about the historic role they've taken, how they've really controlled the river with levees and other hard infrastructure to prevent flooding and preserve navigation. But they're starting to incorporate more engineering with nature, using nature-based solutions in this management of the river. I'm gonna talk to Tim Axman about this. You're in the water loop. Glad to have this conversation with you. Excited to talk to the Army Corps of Engineers. You all have a massive role in the Mississippi River. Could you talk a little bit about that and just what the what the Army's responsibility is when it comes to managing the Mississippi? There's multiple missions when it comes to the Mississippi River. One, uh, of course, is navigation, that, that extending from the Gulf, uh, deep draft up to Baton Rouge and shallow draft up into the Missouri and upper Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Um, the other role particular to this area, of course, is flood control. Right? Uh, we're in a Delta A plane and um, everything here is part of the Delta A plane. So um, ma managing flooding is kind of a imperative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more recent roles involve allocation of the river's resource for ecosystem restoration. Um, so that's uh, rebuilding coastal marshes or uh, barrier islands. Uh, the sediment is a, is a valuable resource for that. And I'll, I'll mention going way back before we had the technical capacity, mm. um, the Louisiana Purchase, right? At that time, it was part of that was to be able to navigate and move goods from the interior to the Gulf and, uh, and export or to other parts of the country. Um, navigation was the primary, right? Keeping the mouth of the river safe and open for navigation. Um, the flood control and navigation expanded over time. Uh, at one point, the, and, and a lot of levees were constructed even before federal involvement. Mm. Plantation owners built small levees, individual levees. Um, when the federal government became involved, then those systems started to become kind of unitized into a single system. Was that in like the early 1800s-ish? That would be probably mid to late 1800s. Okay. Um, you know, moving up to the, the turn of the 20th century. Um, when there was a debate, over several things, how to, how to actually maintain the mouth of the river using, you know, was it dredging, using jetties, using dikes, um, and flood control, which is, uh, should, it, should it just be a continuous levee system containing the river. Uh, the flood of 1927 kind of weighed into that, and it was uh, kind of a levees-only system didn't really work well mm. in that event. Could you just explain that flood just a little, a little bit more, what happened then? Uh, uh, that was a big catastrophic flood. It, <laughs> it was a big catastrophic flood, and a number of levee systems breached um, all through the lower valley from uh, Cairo south. Um, and the floodplain of the Mississippi River is, is a fairly broad floodplain, and, and tens of miles wide in some locations. And a lot of that area flooded, which is what made it so catastrophic. It, it impacted so much area. Yeah. Um, loss of, loss of, I mean, loss, loss of, of crop, lives, loss of, of property. livestock, property, life. Yeah. Um, people were kind of forced into refugee camps because uh, Mississippi River floods aren't kind of short duration events. They're fairly long duration events. Mm -hmm. So uh, it took a while for that water to find its way back into the natural drainage and be removed. Um, and at that 
point as a result of that flood, um, Congress acted and created the Mississippi River Commission uh, to kind of manage the overall uh, operation of the, or oversee, not really manage, but oversee, um, and directed that we come up with a different plan. Mm. And the plan that involves levees and uh, spillways, relief, kind of relief valves to let that water out. Um, in our area here in New Orleans, we have the uh, Bonnie Carey spillway that was constructed in the 30s following that event, which is just north of New Orleans, and, and the Morganza spillway, which is uh, at the northern extent of what New Orleans district would cover. Um, just south of, well, we're, gonna, we're probably going to talk about Old River Control. It's just south of Old River Control, but it predates Old River Control. Mm -hmm. um, and that spillway diverts water into the Atchafalaya Basin mm -hmm. system. And yeah, the spillways are like if the river gets so high that right. it's threatening to go over the, the levees right. or break a levee, you kind of release that water out through these right. spillways and you're like, okay, we're going to flood this yeah. area to, to relieve the right. pressure. Yeah, in the case of Morgans, it releases water into the Atchafalaya Basin, and then the Atchafalaya River carries it then down to the Gulf of Mexico, the vicinity of Morgan City, Louisiana. Um, the Bonnie Carey Spillway, which, and, and these are, both locations were the uh, sites of historic crevassing when the river would breach out of its banks or the smaller levees that were there. Uh, Bonnie Carey actually releases water into Lake Pontchartrain, mm. so almost immediately into Gulf waters, although uh, Lake Pontchartrain is generally kind of a, a brackish mm. lake, more, mm. a little more saline than fresh. So, um, Old River, right, was, which is the, probably the biggest outlet, and it's perpetual, it's not just during floods, um, was constructed in the late 50s, early 60s, I think in the late 40s, um, Harold Fisk, hmm. a geologist who did a, a study and identified that the, the natural connection between the Mississippi River and actually it flows in, into the Red River, which then flows into the <laughs> Atchafalaya River, was increasing in the volume of flow it was taking. Um, and the, the con, kind of the conventional wisdom based on some British studies and some channel bendway cutoff studies said that once, once the uh, acquiring channel reached about 45% of flow, it was, that was a done deal. The, so, the, the course was shifting. So the, yeah, the Mississippi would quote, jump. Jump to the Atchafalaya. And, and go that way. And um, then what would that do to Baton Rouge and New Orleans? Well, the concern was that with, with all the industry navigation that was there, it would leave them high and, and dry. Mm. Um, the, the temporal components of that, right, it's, it, it's still a big channel, even with that switch yeah. and, and, and uh, silting in. It was still going to take a good bit of water. Um, how much and how long was an unknown. But I think when, when Fisk did his work, the, the, the Chafalai was taking about 35% or 30% of the flow. Uh, it, it did at one point get to about 35, even after construction of the Little River, because it was treated without operation. Mm. Just a hard point that was going to regulate flow. Um, but the difference in length from that point to the Gulf of Mexico was so drastically different, shorter in the Atchafalaya, the slope was continuing to acquire that flow. Mm. Um, so then we had to go into a regulated op operation to maintain a 30-70 distribution between the Atchafalaya, red, red and Atchafalaya and the Mississippi. Um, and so, you know, again, post the 1927 flood, you, you have the old river control structure. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a, a newer era then right. of managing the river. And uh, could you describe that, kind of what, what that looks like? Yeah, well, now we have a pretty well designed, regulated system. Everything is operated for thresholds and, and triggers. Um, you know, one thing that we see with some certainty is the, the system is 
is prone to change, right? Mm. That's, that's how the natural system works. Um, one of the downsides of more water going to the Shafalaya Basin is it's, it's a giant natural swamp mm. and highly valuable as such, but the more water and sediment you put in there, the more it fills in, mm. right? And it disappears. Um, conversely, as deltas build out or you starve them of water, they contract. One that's easily easy to find, and I think is, is kind of in, insightful at a, at a high level, is the map of the historic deltas of the river over the last 10,000 years. Wow. So it's like seven or eight of those. And you can find them where it traces the outlines of where these deltas have mm. been and it lay, overlays it on the, the fairly current landscape. Um, and, and the takeaway I generally point out to people from that is it's what you don't see. Right? You mm. see these big loops of where there were, these deltas were or are presently. But if you look at what it's overlaying, deltas have been there in some cases two, I don't think there's anywhere I see three areas of overlap, but there's nothing there now, mm. right? right. Des despite, and, there, and this is without any real human intervention in, in natural process, which, mm. which tells you that isn't meant to be, per that's not mm. how nature works. It's not, it's not meant to be permanent. Our, our, yeah, our sure. restoration problem isn't about <clears throat> loss, it's about rate of loss. And that's what you know the Army Corps has had the lead role in right. is is keeping the river flowing through Baton Rouge right. and New Orleans and these places and not doing all of that shifting. Right. So you have this kind of you know controlled, controlled. levied right. corridor, fifteen hundred miles yeah. or so. Right. Yeah. You there's been a I guess a a little bit of a shift. Or an, or an attempt to try to do engineering with nature. Right. That's what the, the Army Corps calls it. You know, I'm looking at nature-based solutions. Those are kind of interchangeable. Right. Could you talk about why that has come up as, as yeah. uh, a bit of a priority for the Corps? I think, in particular to the coastal Louisiana, the New Orleans district area, mm -hmm. um, there has been a recognition for some time in, in that rate of retreat, accelerating rate of retreat of the coastal landscape. And, and so part of that, and there's multiple forcing factors involved in that, but a big part of that is the availability of the river resource to get to those landscapes, which is, again, back to those deltas. It, mm -hmm. They were created by the rise and overflow of, of the river. Um, and so, one of the areas of focus, we talk about coastal restoration, but really about reconnecting the resource with the landscape. Um, and we've done that on some smaller scales, um, small diversions that initially looked at, well, how do we regulate water quality, right? So we don't see kind of a habitat shifting, mm. you know, encroaching of more saline habitats into fresher areas. What are, um, what are the examples of those? Here? That would be uh, the Davis Pond diversion and the Carnarvon diversion, which are actually built back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and their focus was more on resource management, maintaining the habitat, maintaining the fisheries that utilize that habitat, um, because there's large economies associated with, with those as well. Um, and, it, and they actually, the, they kind of predate the Corps having the environmental restoration mission. Um, mm. The mm. difference being, okay, we, we do things based on the economic return for having done them. Well, with the advent of the environmental restoration mission, now we do things simply for the value of restoring the landscape, not necessarily the, the economy associated with that. And yeah. that, that made a change in scale. Uh, so now we look at larger type projects in terms of allocating resources. Uh, the state of Louisiana has been involved at, in that. They're kind of the, the lead now. Um, you know, the, the challenge is what's good for one part of the ecosystem yeah. isn't necessarily good for all parts of the ecosystem. There's large trades that go with that, and there are, of course, economies associated with that. So it's uh, it's not without challenges. Um, we continue to look at those. Currently, we're, we're doing uh, 
a reinvestigation of the lower river. Mm. Comprehensive management, how do, we, how do we manage for navigation? How do we manage for flood control? What is the allocation of the, you know, in terms of fl flood control, we're, <clears throat> we're trying to get rid of the water. Right? We're not necessarily mm -hmm. trying to manage for application, mm -hmm. we're just trying to get rid of the water. So, but the, as part of this, this new look at, the, at managing the river, you talk navigation, right, and, f and flood control, mm -hmm. but, it, but also resource allocation and the, and the yeah. environmental side. That's, that's really interesting that that's yeah. part of what's being looked yeah. at. Um, and then as a planner, you know, you're in the planning side. Right. How do you kind of take that engineering with nature or nature-based solutions and now think about that or look for opportunities to right. use it? Well, I think a lot of it would probably involves more timing and temporal looks. Uh, we see some folks wanting less of the water and sediment mm -hmm. impacting them. You know, uh, navigation wants less sediment. Uh, Mississippi wants less water. Louisiana, Louisiana, in terms of re helping to restore the coast here, we want more of it. Mm -hmm. right? Water delivers the sediment. We want more sediment to do that restoration. Um, the operational scheme for flood control is kind of fixed on how much water is there for how long. We, we turn this valve, we turn that valve. Um, can we add valves? Mm. Can we turn the valves differently? Um, we tend to operate on you know, that kind of rigid schedule. Mm. Um, so we have to look at it in terms of, okay, can the schedule be more flexible? Mm. And to what benefit? To the benefit of making the water sediment resources available where, where it's desired mm. and maybe avoiding or minimizing where we don't want it. Um, the, so, the, so the engineering with nature for you all is really yeah. this big picture of, right. that means using the river <laughs> to do yeah. what the river can do well right. for the benefit right. generally of nature with yeah. sediment or fresh water or whatever right. it is. Like where can, how can we build more flexibility to put, right. put the river in these other places, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, and that's how it looks here at the bottom of the system, right? <laughs> yeah. As you go up the river, well, it, it looks a little different, right? Mm. There's no, nobody's saying, put, put water and sediment on my pasture or my cropland. Um, there are areas along the river, uh, Yazoo, which is also referred to as the Mississippi Delta mm. in Mississippi, um, because it's a lot of low-lying area uh, laced with channels. Um, and there's other areas like that where one of the things we think about is, well, how, how could we use this resource for groundwater recharge, right? Can, you know, we have diminishing aquifers all throughout the Midwest. Uh, is there a way to actually apply water where it would be useful for that mm -hmm. without, again, impacting those economies that are also using that, that landscape? Um, and again, it's about timing, mm -hmm. timing and location, duration, magnitude. Um, I, lo I, I love hearing that one. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. A total side note, just recently in California, and they're trying to figure out how to, how to capture water when they get heavy rains, put it onto different lands, right. let it soak into the aquifer. It's amazing to hear, yeah. you know, in the, in the water-rich east, if you will, a, right. a similar thinking. Right. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, not original uh, Louisiana, came from the Great Plains, actually, um, where actual allocation of that water is, is a big thing up there for, mm. for farming. You know, so I came from, well, how do we take this and grab it and use it to down here? Where How do we get rid of it? <laughs> right? yeah. and, and now it's kind of circling, well, how, how do we do both? Yeah. Right? Um, and, and it's not just about, when we look at management and planning, it's not simply about the high water when we've got a lot of it. It's also about the low water. You know, we mm. just went through two uh, fairly extreme low water years. Right? We, had, we were fighting the salt water, moving upriver at the lower end here, but we're also challenged by uh, maintaining navigation in the upper part of the river. Um, Is there, uh, for, uh, with 
dry years, wet years, stronger storms, kind of some of the, the changes that are coming from climate. Is, is that another layer of complexity that you all are having to deal with? Or is it becoming uh, more challenging? Uh, well, it, it seemingly, yes, yeah, certainly when we talk about coastal restoration and yeah, with sea, sea level rise has been a pretty much well-measured quantity mm. for some time now. Um, changes in magnitude and fluctuation of river flow, a little more challenging. Mm. That, that's, not a quite, that's not quite as clear mm. how it's changing. or um, It seems to be uh, more variable mm. is what we see. I mean, I, I think you kind of see, if you look around nationally, evidence of that where we went from, particularly on the West Coast, mm. just went from extreme drought to what are we going to do with all this water, yeah. right? Yep. In a matter of two years, um, and there's been incidents of that uh, in in the central part of the country. I know yeah. uh, in the Great Plains, the Upper Missouri reservoirs have been years where you know reservoirs are down yeah. tens yeah. of feet, and in a couple of years, suddenly it's all back and more. Yeah, um, heard it called hydrologic whiplash. Yeah. Um, that was a great example you shared about looking at potentially recharging, you know, yeah. groundwater in the middle area. Are there any other examples, you know, of, of kind of that different type of thinking, uh, you know, that would kind of be engineering with nature aligned? Uh, I think there's currently uh, the state of Louisiana is pursuing some large, lar I say large, larger diversions. Mm. You know, in the context of the river and how much is there. Maybe they're not that large, but relative to the to the the landscape and the current use, yeah, large uh, mid the mid barratory diversion, um, and and that's a case of again trying to introduce sediment. Right, water is the vehicle; the product is the sediment, really that we're looking for um, to help rejuvenate that landscape. Um, and those are things that were in studies that the uh, Louisiana coastal area study we did with the state back around 2000. But it was completed in 2005, just months before mm. Katrina kind of changed everybody's priorities. Mm. Um, so, you know, things, they've kind of taken that challenge on and, and, and it is a challenge, right? It's, um, you know, yeah. the, building a landscape back, that's one of the, uh, interesting things about deltaic growth, right? When, yeah. it's, when it's building, it's not particularly productive, relatively speaking. It's when it's decaying that it's very productive. Well, we've enjoyed a very, a very high level of productivity here in Louisiana because the system has been decaying and now we've reached a point where we can't, we can't stand too much more prosperity you know, <laughs> almost, um, but that affects people's livelihoods, right? sure. that, that shift. And, it, and it's a dramatic shift. It doesn't happen, where the decay happens kind of slowly and everybody adapts to it and may benefit from it. You know, the, the switch to you know, restoration is fairly rapid and, it, and it, it, it doesn't allow a lot of adaptability from, the, from a social standpoint. So yeah. um, it forces change. Yeah. Well, Tim, uh, very informative conversation. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Well, that was a very informative conversation for me. It was interesting to hear the Army Corps explain engineering with nature from their perspective. It's not really about these little projects here and there, but rather bigger picture, allowing the river to go into different places finding ways to do that, and using the water as the vehicle for sediment. Loved that, that visual, and letting the river naturally do what it does out there to the benefit of the ecosystem and the people that use it. Really looking forward to continuing the journey up the river now and talking to some of these other people about their relationship and how they use the river and how they're helping it to improve. You're in the water loop. <laughs>